so this is the first uh, day, first Dharma talk of uh, this four-day retreat, which for the life of me I cannot remember its formal title. Does anybody know the keys? Well, it's on Zen. I mean, that, that I'm clear about. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, let's, so, key point, say that again? Key points of the path of awakening. Teachings of the Zen Masters. Thank you. Uh, because I do have the description here. So I just wanted to, uh, so we all know uh, what we got ourselves into. This is sort of a full disclosure. So it says the fall retreat, so this is what everybody received, and this is what you voluntarily signed up for. The fall retreat is for practitioners who have developed a grounding in mindfulness meditation, mindful living, and have attained a certain degree of emotional stability. Utilizing various pith teachings, dharma verses, and extracts from longer texts, Fred will present the key points of practice for those who seek to utilize dharma as a path of purification and transformation. While the ordinary practices of mindfulness and mindful living can bring greater stability into one's life, the true practice of meditation is not only to heal, but to facilitate a significant experiential transformation in the spheres of one's body, speech, and mind. To accomplish this, the practitioner must be committed to courageously stepping into unknown and sometimes uncomfortable territories of personal experience, to shed the skin of their habitual tendencies and let go of skewed and distorted ways of perceiving themselves and others. Not a bad job, I would say. So, are there any, I mean, any questions about uh, what we're getting into? That everybody signed up for. This is, you know, this is that opportunity. If anybody wants to bail, this is the time. <laughs> because uh, we do like to be comfortable. And we are very used to our stuff. And many of us think that a spiritual life means to uh, kind of uh, have some level of remediation of our stuff, of our emotional discomfort, uh, learning some new skills, etc., uh, including uh, mindfulness. And that, uh, you know, and it's primarily to really increase our comfort in the world. Uh, and again, uh, for worldly people to want to increase their comfort in the world and their ease in the world is certainly uh, what worldly life is about, isn't it? Right? The purpose of worldly life is to find comfort and ease and happiness and enjoyment in the things of the world. And this is, uh, this is the way we have been raised, right? Uh, but uh, the Dharma, uh, as taught by the uh, Buddha, and especially as it's been transmitted in the uh, Zen uh, tradition, uh, goes much more beyond that. And for those of us uh, ensnared in the world, uh, it's hard to us uh, for us to uh, really, even though we may hear the words and uh, pay lip service to, it is hard for us to really believe that there is another way. Uh, but it is true. <laughs> and that is what we are taught. And that is what we are practicing. So, uh, transformation. Shed the skin of habitual tendencies. Let go of skewed and distorted ways of perceiving themselves and others. Uh, for many of us right now, that doesn't make sense. Right, because we think our skewed and distorted ways are not skewed or distorted, right? That is the problem, right? We are like P 
people who have grown up in the fun house at the circus and all those distorted mirrors we think are, you know, what we look like. We've never seen a real mirror that reflects clearly. We've seen the mirrors that distort, right? Uh, we are like people who've always uh, worn certain colored glasses from as far back as we can remember, so we think the world is blue or red or purple. It seems so obvious. Right. Uh, so the practice of meditation, which is at the core of, uh, of Zen, uh, is, is really examining the mirror, examining the lens, to really uh, see not only uh, how it distorts and skews, but to really uh, learn how to uh, see really clearly. You all know that, right? Yes, I know you do. So, uh, Zen. Before we talk about Zen, any questions in terms of just what you've been up to so far since last night in your meditation, this morning, sitting, walking, eating? Are there any anything about the practice that is not clear to you about how to practice? Or any uh, challenges or difficulties arising that you didn't expect to arise, you don't know how to deal with or handle, respond to? This is, yes. You need a nap. Well, you know, you mean you're tired, right? You see, you, you, you're saying you're tired, but you think the solution is a nap. But you see, that's the way our mind works. We, 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 we talk that way. I need a nap. Well, we're tired. That is the issue. But maybe there are other ways to wake us up. Right? So, I mean, if right away there was a gunshot went off behind you, uh, I would imagine you would, have, you would not say, I, I need a nap. <laughs> right? Right, if Bill over here went into cardiac arrest, you would not say, well, I need a nap, you know. <laughs> you, you see, you, you see what I'm saying? Or if you had uh, something that you really wanted to do, right, you would kind of wake, you know what I mean? You, you would arouse yourself. So, uh, I don't mean to pick on you, <laughs> but I'm just pointing out for all of us that, that we... we um, you know, uh, for those uh, who are familiar with the Buddhist meditative path, we know that in the literature and you know, in the talks and everything uh, given by teachers uh, since the time of the Buddha, uh, we know that two of the major uh, uh, challenges you know, that one runs into in meditation is the, uh, well, there, there are four or five of them, but, you know, is torpor and excitement, right? So those are the two uh, kind of things we want to, you know, we can get off balance to, right? So, the, so whether it is a sleepiness or a kind of a laziness or a lack of enthusiasm or a boredom or a heaviness, you know, that's kind of, you know, we can easily fall into that side. On the other hand, kind of an excitable mind, a kind of jumpy mind, a highly distractible mind, a, you know, uh, that's also a danger. So the fact that you're experiencing that, that shows you you're, you're normal and that you are fine dealing with things. But having said that, we, we, we have to understand that these are things that are going to come up and that we can deal with them. Um, again, I mean, the way I just pointed out that in your imagination, you could, you know, if you said if all of a sudden or if, 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 if you knew that you were going to die uh, tonight, Right? you might want to kind of live life to the fullest <laughs> while you're alive and not, you see, so, so it's just interesting how, how easily it is, even just in terms of how we reflect, you see, how we can wake ourselves up. Or, you know, we, we all know that just somehow just sitting up straight and, you know what I mean, and just kind of energizing ourselves or, 
uh, if you were, you know, I mean, now not, but you know, to, you know, outside of the meditation, to go outside and take some deep breaths and kind of jump around a little bit, or you know, go throw some cold water on your face, or you know what I mean? There, there are ways. So it's not as if these things are going to come up, aren't going to come up. It's just that we have to realize that we, we don't have to indulge them and go take a nap. <laughs> Now, it's not saying later in the day when there is nap time, and if you're tired, you see, it's it's not like nap is bad, but it's, it's just, you know, we just, we're always pulled by this mind of ours, and that never allows us really to settle on and really get strong and enthusiastic about the matter. And again, many of us uh, uh, are quite enthusiastic and energized by worldly goals, right? If you work somewhere and you have a project to get it done or there's a deadline, how do you find yourself? Energized, right? You don't go, well, screw the deadline, I'm going to go take a nap, right? <laughs> you see, you, you know, I mean, so, so we, we are quite used to, or if there's something pleasurable coming up or something, you know, but you know what I mean? We, 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 we certainly know that we can get highly enthusiastic about kind of just worldly things, worldly, when I say worldly things, I mean things that have no, uh, you know, intrinsic significance and are only giving us a happiness or a pleasure only as long as the experience lasts. Right? So, you know, for that we have lots of enthusiasm and lots of energy. Uh, But what we find when we come to our Dharma practice, when we come to meditation, when we come to mindfulness, uh, we, we find that kind of enthusiasm uh, hard to come by. Why is that? Because, what? We're really not that interested, are we? We really don't really want the benefits that much. You know, we like the short-term solutions, Right? Right? For the immediacy of pleasure or rewards or getting something done, we can be highly enthusiastic. But for, uh, you know, Buddhahood, <laughs> I'm just going all the way out there. For Buddhahood, it's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, what's on Netflix tonight? You know, uh, you know, transformation, shedding the skin, really being free of my neuroses and all my emotional afflictions and. Mm, it's kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's time, maybe, maybe I, I, I could really use a nap, just even thinking about that. Just kinda. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we have to really see that the problem is with, within our own minds and our lack of enthusiasm, our lack of energy, that again, if we are honest with ourselves, we see we have in so many areas of our life, and yet in this area of our life, uh, it's a grind, it's a struggle. Well, so it's how we approach it. Right? And also, I think part of the problem is we are, you know, we like success. We like immediate success. Right? We don't like things that are really, you know, that we can't get right away. You know, that we can't succeed at right away. That's a process. Right? And the idea that, you know, you just got to show up every day and you got to do the practice no matter how you feel or what you think. And in time, you will ripen, you know. This is, this is a practice of ripening. Right? If anybody's ever watched a fruit ripen, what have you noticed? It's slow. But it will ripen. And if it's a good fruit, it will be delicious. Right? But if you uh, don't understand the process of ripening, right, you know, you will pass by that delicious fruit and you'll go for the junk food because that'll give you what? Immediate satisfaction, right? And that's kind of, that sums it up for many of us. So, and again, actually I'll be talking about some of these things today. So, so thank you for your comment. Uh, any other just questions about the practices that we've done so far today and any obstacles you may be running into? 
Yes. Yeah, so the question was uh, this morning dizziness and nausea. Now, usually nausea and dizziness does not come up. So, I mean, you, you immediately ruled out any kind of physio physical or physiological. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe there was something just going on within you. But so I wouldn't, uh, so if you've really ruled that out and you go, no, I'm really feeling fine and everything is fine and out of nowhere it's coming, then you, obviously you're kind of going psychosomatic, psychological, something in the body. I mean, something that, that's not related to any kind of uh, right, physical illness or problem. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, but I would say... You know, to me, whenever anything comes up, I always ask it what it's about. Because, obviously, you, that's part of you that's experiencing it, doesn't understand what it's about. And if it's really about something other than, you know, you're sick, you know, or you're having a rea you know, stomach reaction or something, or, you know, it, that knows it. You know, oftentimes people go, I don't know why this feeling arrived. I don't know why I feel this way. Well, you know, ask it. Communicate with that feeling because it knows. Right? Uh, and obviously, see, we're so used to thinking our way through things. It's like, i got to figure this out. But, like it's a, but it's already a part of me. It's like the thinking part of me has got to figure out the emotional part of me. Right? rather than just kind of get out of the way and let me just communicate with that emotional part of me and, and ask it in its own language to tell me what's, what's going on, what's bothering it, why is it sad or scared or angry. It knows. So, you know, the practice of non-duality is the practice of being willing to enter into everything. And oftentimes we are sort of separated from ourselves. We, we don't, you know, emotions come up, feelings come up, or, you know, mindsets come up, you know, like, what's going on? Well, obviously something's going on, and it's going on within who? Within me. It's part of me. So embrace like that. But, you know, I mean, there's also unknowns. I mean, sometimes things just, you know, I mean, uh, certainly the spiritual life practice is a kind of... Uh, unconscious purification, we might say, physical. And so sometimes things just kind of pass through or something that's been undigested coming, you know, it's getting digested. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, just kind of uh, get out of the way and let the process happen. Thank you. So, so uh, for those who are not familiar with Zen, I'm just going to do a little bit of, through anecdotes, kind of give a sense of it. Uh, so, uh, it is said that the uh, Zen tradition uh, began uh, with the Buddha. Uh, every Buddhist lineage, every Buddhist tradition traces itself back to the Buddha. Now, many historians take issue with that <laughs> uh, they, because they think these, uh, you know, many of the schools or whatever developed later, they developed out of Buddhism, which is not to say the, the, these weren't Buddhist schools, but the, the direct lineage back to the Buddha, to an incident or a person, uh, it was often done later on to kind of establish authenticity. I mean, that's what uh, many academics are historians. And there's probably some truth, because if, you ever, uh, if you've ever been in a Zen, uh, more formal Zen uh, temple or something, or center, and they recite the, uh, you know, the patriarchs going back to the Buddha, 
uh, you will hear the names of people, you know, like first, with, you know, the second, the third, the fourth, that were like hundreds and hundreds of years, even historically people know, uh, you know, li they lived at different times. So, but it's, you know, kind of their way. It doesn't mean that these weren't the traditions and the energies that didn't, uh, and the teachings that didn't inform uh, the school, but this lineage. Uh, may not have unfolded that way. But anyhow, according to the Zen tradition, uh, this was the first, uh, this was the first, this was the original transmission on Zen. And I want to read it because I think it gives a flavor of what Zen has originally was about. So I'm just reading for something I got off the internet. Toward the end of his life, the Buddha took his disciples to a quiet pond for instruction. As they had done so many times before, the Buddha's followers sat in a circle around him and waited for his teaching. But this time the Buddha had no words. He reached into the muck and pulled up a lotus flower, and he held it silently before them, its roots dripping mud and water. The disciples were greatly confused. Buddha quietly displayed the lotus to each of them. In turn, the disciples did their best to expound upon the meaning of the flower, what it symbolized, and how it fit into the body of the Buddha's teachings. When at last the Buddha came to his follower Mahakashapa, Mahakashapa, one of the great uh, senior disciples of the Buddha, the, dis uh, the disciple suddenly understood and remaining silent, smiled. Thereupon the Buddha said, I have the true eye of the Dharma, the profound mind of Nirvana, the reality transcending all forms, the supreme and subtle teaching, inexpressible by words and speech, this mind seal outside of scriptures, I now transmit to Mahakashapa. And so Mahakashapa is considered the first Zen patriarch. And there is a quote uh, from Bodhidharma, and we'll talk about Bodhidharma soon. And it's a famous kind of verse uh, in the Zen tradition uh, that when he was asked to describe, uh, you know, what he was, you know, this lineage, this tradition that he was transmitting, uh, that he brought from India uh, to China, he said, a special transmission outside the scriptures, not dependent on words and speech, directly pointing at the mind, see into one's true nature, and become a Buddha. Everything clear? So it's, this is, you know, very interesting for many reasons. Uh, but please notice uh, that the Buddha, um, you know, we know that the uh, historical Buddha Shakyamuni taught for 49 years, and he primarily taught using words. Uh, we know the Buddhist tradition uh, has many, many teachings uh, of the Buddhas and, continue, and, and from many teachers and masters to this day. So, uh, the Buddha did not say, uh, please disregard everything I've said up to now. Right? I mean, that's, some people misinterpret that. Okay? He didn't say, uh, you know, you can totally ignore all the scriptures and all the teachings that I've given up to now, uh, you know, and just uh, hold up flowers. He didn't say that, did he? Okay? And he was speaking to, obviously, a group of, you know, intimate disciples who had been practicing with him for years and were very used to his teaching, right? To hearing his words, to 
learning, to being, to learning from the Buddha, to being guided from the Buddha, uh, from, from learning from his wisdom and his understanding. This is what they were used to. Is that clear? Okay. So, on this day, he didn't do what they were used to. Right? And you notice, unless, out for Mahakashapa, nobody of his great disciples could kind of deal with the fact that the Buddha was not speaking. Right? That he was not using words. And that he was holding up simply a flower. Right? So, you know, we have to understand that this is not a negation of everything the Buddha has said, but obviously he was trying to take his senior students, small group, to a truer, deeper level of understanding. Right? So, he doesn't give them what they want. He doesn't give them what they're used to or comfortable with. Right? He kind of pulls out the rug from under them and holds up a flower and doesn't say anything. And as he kind of, according to this, as he kind of goes around asking for them, everybody kind of what? Talks. <laughs> Gives an intellectual explanation about the symbol of the flower and the meaning of the flower, what the te- or how the flowers holding up the flower ties into the teaching. Right? Everybody's lost in words and concepts, and the Buddha is presenting something to them which has nothing to do with words and concepts, but is pointing to directly to the mind. If you think that the teaching the Buddha gives them is about flowers is a horticultural uh, exposition, you know, you know, have you never really ever looked closely at a flower? No, that's not the teaching. He's talking about the mind. He's asking them, do you directly perceive the nature of your mind? Not the flower, the mind that is perceiving aware of the flower. Do you know that? Do you understand what I've been teaching all these years beyond words? Have you, have you gotten to the meaning of what I've been telling you day after day? And according to this, only Mahakashapa understood. And so it is said that, in essence, Zen, the Zen tradition, is a transmission outside the scriptures, meaning there is something else that's being transmitted in the Zen lineage that is not about writings, it is not dependent on words, it's speech, it points directly to the mind. And if some of you wonder, well, what is a mind? That which is right now, hearing, perceiving, seeing, that is your mind. Is that clear? That is your mind. This is our mind. Nothing exists outside of this. But we don't see this because we're always looking at the objects and we're always lost in words. So in this moment, the Buddha, you know, pulls it all away and says, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, you know, we settle down. Time for the Buddha to give a nice little talk again. We'd love to hear the Buddha give a talk. You know, so wise. Right? Time goes by so quickly when you're listening to the Buddha give a talk. Up there in Vulture Peak. Anybody's ever been to Vulture Peak in India? Quite beautiful. But he shakes them up. He doesn't give them what they want. He's pointing in a different direction. So, what, what you're getting is in a flavor, even though, obviously, many, 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 many books on Zen. Many, 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 many Zen teachers have given talks. Right? But yet, 
the, the specialness of Zen is this, is this understanding that there is an understanding and a realization that is beyond words and letters, beyond scripture. It has to do with the meaning of words, the meaning of the scriptures, right? And that meaning is only found in the mind. It is not to be found anywhere else. So it says directly pointing at the mind, See, and then, and again, obviously we'll be dealing with this over the next three or four days. See into one's true nature and become a Buddha. Okay, so this is also, you know, very, um, uh, I mean, not to say that there aren't Buddhist, other Buddhist traditions uh, uh, that uh, have this, uh, have this uh, goal or this possibility but, you know, this, this understanding in Zen that anyone who sees into their true nature, anybody who sees into the nature of reality, that is what a Buddha is. Okay? When people used to ask the Buddha, you know, who, like, can I, you know, who are you? What are you? He would simply say, I am awake. I'm awake. So what is he awakened to? He's awakened to the to the to reality. He's awakened to the truth, the way things really are. That's what he's awake to. Right? When we're asleep, we don't we don't know what's going on really, do we? Because we are all we know is our dreams. We're lost in our dream world. And in our dream world, all our dreams seem very real to us, don't they? We're lost in the drama of our dreams, our happy dreams, our sad dreams, our wonderful dreams, our terrible dreams, our meaningful dreams, our meaningless dreams, right? That is the nature of, of, lost, of, of the sleep world. Or we're unconscious <laughs> when we're not dreaming. But when we wake up, we know, oh, this is reality. Oh. And all of a sudden, everything that we dreamed and thought was going on and all the dramas of the dreaming, we know it's just a dream and it just disappears. Right? Everybody know what? Right? Okay. So this is what we're talking about. That, that's why it is often talked about awakening. Waking up. I am awake. It is a, it is a idea or a concept that we are familiar with. We do it every day. So he's using a term, a terminology, that, that we can relate to. Oh, that's what it means. Except for many of us, we're still in the dream world. Except this is the waking dream world we're in. We think all our thoughts and our feelings and our perceptions and our memories and our dramas, we think that's what's real. Just the way when we're asleep, we think all the dramas of our dreams are real. So in the same way, sleepers awake, we want to awaken. You know, we wake up from our sleep dreams in the same way we want to awaken from this dream. The dream of duality and separation. So again, Zen directly point at the mind, see into one's true nature and become a Buddha. Okay, so that's ultimately what we're about. That may sound, well, I don't know, how does that sound to you? Like impossible? Right? What? Splendid. Oh, splendid, good. Well, that's good. See, because we may think, you see, again, the Buddha... You know, this doesn't mean a fully awakened Buddha like Shakyamuni who is, you know, whose teaching resounds for 2,600 years. And, but it means in the truest sense of what a Buddha is, which is an awakened one. We all have that capacity to wake up. That's what it means to become a Buddha. And if we wake up and if we practice diligently for lifetime after lifetime and to totally cleanse ourselves of all our uh, delusions, 
all our impurities, uh, eventually we will be able to manifest as a fully manifesting enlightened Buddha. But now to see into one's true nature and become a Buddha, an awakened one is a Buddha. Now, uh, so according to the Zen tradition, um, this transmission, mind to mind transmission, right? And so that is why when you, um, you know, when you enter uh, the Zen tradition uh, or you go to the Zen monasteries, they chant their lineage. So they will chant all the patriarchs from the Buddha uh, through Mahakashapa down uh, uh, to, uh, to, well, if you're, let's say, in China, uh, to Bodhidharma, the Indian patriarch who came to China. And then bum, 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 up, 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 all the way. And if you were in Vietnam or if you were in Korea or if you are in Japan or the other uh, Asian countries where Zen, you would then continue until the present day. Is that clear? Because Zen is a transmission outside of scriptures. It's traditionally, at its best, been a transmission of awakened mind to awakened mind. So it is a mind-to-mind -mind transmission. And it is kept pure by the fact that you didn't go to school for it, you, didn't, you don't have a degree in it, you were kind of certified in it by a, by a teacher, right? Who certifies to your awakening, to your realization. So, so there's a quality control mechanism in this transmission at its best. So, you know, it is said uh, that, you know, in the same way, you know, if we're to believe the anecdotes, it was kind of a one-day thing with the flower, but uh, Mahakashapa got it. And supposedly, even though Mahakashapa was a senior great uh, leader of the Buddha Sangha, and after the Buddha's passing, he was one of the great elders of the Buddha's, Buddhist monastic Sangha, he privately <laughs> passed this wordless teaching on. And it stayed alive in, uh, in uh, India for uh, many years. And then in the... Uh, around the 6th century AD, uh, this uh, Indian master, name of Bodhidharma, right, uh, came to, he was from South India, came to, yes? Dharma? Dharma is an Dharma, or is it like a different word for Dharma? Well, Bodhidharma? Bo Bodhidharma, enlightened Dharma. Bodhi means enlightened, awakened. You're not attached to words, are you? Uh, no. Good. Just try. His name was Bodhidharma, as far as we know. I mean, very, historically, not much is known about him. So again, I mean, there is some historical reference that there was somebody who showed up around that time, uh, but in the Zen literature, he is considered the first patriarch of uh, Chinese uh, Zen which is, by the way, called Chan. Zen is Japanese. So ch people who are Chinese Buddhists in Vietnamese, it's called, what, do, you, do you know what it's called in Vietnamese? The Zen sect? Tinso? Yeah, yeah. So again, please understand that, <laughs> that oftentimes people in these, in other, and in, I think it's called Chogye or something in Korean, you know, <coughs> They have their own name. So Zen is is the Japanese, <laughs> the Japanization of the word Chan. Chan is Chinese. Chinese Buddhists practice Chan. They don't practice Zen. Okay, I mean it's, it's the same word. But in Vietnam, they also have their everybody has their own word because they have their own lineages. In the same way, like in Vietnam, like Thich Nhat Hanh, he has his lineage. It comes from Lin Chi, uh, who was one of the great patriarchs of uh, Chinese Zen, but then when it came to Zen, he then has his own lineage of, of Vietnamese uh, patriarchs until his teacher and then to himself. 
same way in Japan, same way in Korea. So we know that uh, in the uh, in the history of Zen, uh, this uh, master shows up in uh, comes from southern India. We know that you know you went from going from southern India by boat to uh, China was not all that difficult. Uh, shows up in the uh, in the Liang Dynasty in the sixth century, and Buddhism uh, had been in um, in China for you know many centuries. There were Buddhist monasteries and Buddhist temples and Buddhist was practiced. And the emperor of the Liang dynasty uh, was a very devout Buddhist. His name was Emperor Wu. And so this anecdote is quite... Uh, and again, I'm just doing these things. It gives you a flavor. So, uh, so we, uh, the emperor, you know, being a very devout Buddhist, heard about this new uh, master who had come from India. And he invited him to come to his palace. Right, he wanted to meet him. Okay, he'd heard about him, and so uh, Bodhidharma comes in, or they have a meeting, and uh, and the emperor says, "I have built many temples. I have printed innumerable innumerable sutras. Sutras are the scriptures of the Buddha, and decreed the ordination of many monks. Right, since becoming emperor." What would you say? These are great deeds. He's a, he's, a, he's a great supporter of the Dharma, right? He builds temples and monasteries. He, he makes sure that scriptures are, are printed and available to anybody at no cost. Uh, he supports the ordination of monks and nuns, right? Therefore, I ask you, he's asking Bodhidharma, what is my merit from all these uh, deeds? And again, in traditional Buddhism, and those who are familiar with traditional Buddhism, earning merit or punya is very much the practice. By doing good deeds, by especially doing good deeds of supporting the Dharma, supporting the Sangha, uh, one is earning great merit, right? In the same way worldly people earn great money, right? From their, that's what they want to earn, right? From their great endeavors, they want to earn great money. And in the spiritual world, the Dharma world, great people who do great deeds think they're earning a lot of merit. So he asked uh, Bodhidharma, what is my merit from all these good deeds? He's obviously quite what? Proud of himself. He thinks I'm, I'm one hell of a Buddhist emperor, aren't I? And Bodhidharma, and think of the courage of this. Anybody who can thinks about traditional societies, and this is the emperor, you know, all power of life and death. What is my merit from all these good deeds? And Bodhidharma says, no merit whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, that takes guts, right? You know, off with his head, as you would say, you know, this was... If this was Alice in Wonderland, off with his head, right? I mean, it took a lot of, a, a lot of guts, right? So just, you know, the power of this man. You can see. This is Bodhidharma behind me. Okay, you see, he's, he's not warm and fuzzy. <laughs> I mean, you get a flavor of him. He's not warm and fuzzy. He's not the peaceful Buddha with the half smile, is he? This is Bodhidharma, the founder of Zen. He's fierce. He cuts through. He's not afraid. No merit whatsoever. And Peru, he's confused. It's like, so that's good. He doesn't get angry, you know, but it's like, what? What? You know, no merit? What, you know, what do you, what, what, what? So he asks him, you know, so what, so what, what do you mean? I mean, he's just, you know, it's like his whole reason for doing all these good deeds, his whole practice of Buddhism is to earn great merit. And Bodhidharma says, you haven't earned any merit. And so he says, why no merit? And Bodhidharma says, doing things for merit has an impure motive and will only bear the puny fruit of a good rebirth. Right? And so, and so you realize that for many, it's like, it's sort of like what I said earlier. You know, we practice Dharma, but why do we really practice Dharma? For worldly benefits. To be more comfortable, be more at ease, 
life goes better, relationships go better, you know? We're, we're, we're really practicing Dharma to earn some good worldly merit for ourselves. Is that clear? Right. And, and so, now again, Bodhi, we have to understand it's sort of like when I said earlier, you know, uh, you know, the Buddha didn't hold up, you know, if, if, you know, if somebody comes to the Buddha, he doesn't, you know, no matter, you know, somebody comes with a real issue or problem, right? The Buddha didn't just hold up a flower and smile, right? So all the Buddha's teachings and all the teachings of the masters are always in the service of helping that person. Is that clear? You know, somebody else, you know, or somebody else might have come to him and uh, to Bodhidharma said, oh, I'm really, you know, I'm trying to be such a good person. I'm really doing everything I can to be a wonderful person, a good person, to be of help to people. And then the master might have said, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You know, continue. That's you. You're, 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 you're a real Buddhist. You see what I'm saying? It, and you might go, what? <laughs> but they're all true. But because people are a different level. All right, so this is the emperor, and he, and the, and 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 Bodhidharma uh, saw how much pride he had, and he's also somebody of great influence. So he says, you know, he 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 got right to him. He said, yeah, you're you know you're doing all these good deeds not just for good not for goodness, but you're you're trying to earn some merit. You want something for yourself. You have an impure motive. It's like somebody who's very philanthropic, you know, does it donates a great thing, but wants to make sure everybody knows they did it. You know, good deed, impure motive. Right? If you only care about good deeds, so what? But if you're really, you know, a little deeper, the important thing is really the motive. Right? Which is the mind. So he says, uh, doing things for merit has an impure motive. The motor is just to benefit me. You're, you're doing things that, you're, you, that look like you're benefiting others, but you really are only doing it for your own benefit, and the only thing it'll give you is a, a better rebirth. Again, in those days, and still to today, many people believe in rebirth. So they believe that, you know, you know doing good deeds, uh, purifying things in that way, you know, a good chance, you know. So traditionally, if you wanted to be wealthy, your next lifetime, or even this time, lifetime, you know how you get to be wealthy? You be generous. It's very interesting. You, know, you give, 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 give. Because you're building good karma for getting, getting, getting. Things will come to you. It's very interesting. So, and, and, and so that's what the, you know, the emperor's up to. So doing things for merit, impure motive, only bear the puny fruit of rebirth. So now Emperor Wu is a little put out, it says. <laughs> he's getting a little, now he's getting a little. <laughs> because not only has he been told he has no merit, he's not earning any merit, but he is also told that he has an impure motive and he's, and he's not going to reap anything of great significance. He's just going to get a little better rebirth next time. So then the Empress says, a little put out, it's according to this, then what is the highest truth of Buddhism? This is very wonderful. And this you can see Bodhidharma's skill as a teacher. See, he kind of let him in. You see? He didn't say this first. He sounded like, you know, kind of just keeps pulling out the rug from him. Right? No merit, no virtue, egocentric, you know? Get some of the, 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 the emperor's off balance now. He's, he's put out. He's confused. He's a little angry. But the good thing, obviously, is he, he comes back, you know, with a question. Well, if I've really, you know, if I've really been totally off base, according to you, Mr. Big Shot from South India, uh, what then is the highest truth of Buddhism? And Bodhidharma replies, vast emptiness with nothing to be called holy, nothing sacred. Very famous line in Zen. What is the highest truth in Buddhism? Vast emptiness and nothing sacred, nothing to be called holy.
So now the emperor, befuddled, bewildered, indignant, says to Bodhidharma, after this vast emptiness with nothing to call, uh, with nothing holy or sacred, and so he says to him, who is this who stands before me? Like, who are you? And Bodhidharma says, I don't know. Don't know. Very profound, just don't know. Uh, this is not the don't know. I mean, of course Bodhidharma knew his name. <laughs> but he, he, he continues. You know. At the deepest level, there's nothing to know. Right? We know the knowing that the, that the emperor is asking him is about name and form, right? Who are you? Tell me your story. You know, where were you born? What happened to you? You know, that's like us. You know, we know who we are, right? My name is so-and-so, and I was born here, and this happened to me, and that happened to me. I did this and that, and these are my, these are my good, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, you know, this is, you know what I mean? This is, right? Right? These are my issues, you know, you know, I, I mean, I know who I am. No. That's who we, that's the dream. You see, that's the dream. That's the dream self. So Barney Barmer goes, don't know. Right? You know he's not, he's not going to give him anything to hold on to, is he? Very profound. Just don't know. It's like don't know in Zen is a, is a practice. Just don't know. There was a Korean Zen teacher who's passed on who was, you know, here in the 70s and 80s called Sun Sunim, and his great line was, don't know, just go straight. <laughs> great teacher. You know, don't, don't think about things. I don't want to be figuring out. Just have a don't know attitude and just, do, just go straight in life. Right? Just, just do the next thing. Do the right thing. Just, you know, just do it. Don't know. Just go straight. Anyhow, you know, we could spend the whole retreat on, on this anecdote. But, uh, so Emperor Wu could not, I mean, could not understand Bodhidharma. Didn't get it. And so Bodhidharma, after this uh, in exchange, according to the uh, history, uh, Zen history, uh, Bodhidharma, based on this exchange, felt, since this, you know, the Emperor Wu was like the highest, you know, the Chinese Buddhist, he goes, these people are not ready f for, for Zen, for John, for, for what I have. So uh, he left the court and he went to Shaolin Mountain, where he sat facing a wall for nine years said. Just sat. Uh, it's called wall gazing. Just sat in the cave, just meditating. These people are not ready for what I have to offer. Uh, so I want to read just one more anecdote, which is, um, so he taught, and he wouldn't, I mean, he sat, and he wouldn't, people would hear about this Indian meditation master up in the cave, uh, but he wouldn't speak to anybody, and he wouldn't teach anybody, right? Because he really felt that people, they, they were not ready for, for what he had to offer. Uh, and so people wondered who he was, the local people, and they called him the wall-gazing Brahmin. So if you look at Bodhidharma, you will see that he is represented. You see, he's, 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 uh, he's got a beard. You see? And he's got an earring often. Do they have an, does he have an earring? Yeah. And this is in traditional Chinese iconography. This is to show that he was Indian. Chinese people are, uh, don't, most of them don't have beard. They're fair skinned. They don't wear earrings. So he was an Indian. So he said, uh, people called him the wall gazing Brahmin. Brahmin means Indian, sort of. At that time, there was a Buddhist monk named Shen Quan who was widely, uh, uh, wide, widely informed. I don't know what that means. Who was widely informed and had been living in Yogyang for a long time. He had read many uh, Buddhist books 
and non-Buddhist books. And he said, the teachings of Confucian and Lao Tse, too, are but customs and etiquette. The, bo the books of Xuan Tzu and the I Ching do not plumb the depth of the wonderful principle. Lately, I've heard there's a master Dharma teacher living near Shaolin. With the supreme man so near to me, I should be able to reach deeper realms of understanding. Okay. So, uh, this is a man, a, a book monk, who very conversant with Buddhist teachings and practices, but felt hadn't had, hadn't uh, come to any kind of realization of meaning, deeper than words, and obviously felt from the teachers who were there uh, they weren't capable of giving. So when he heard about this Brahmin who just stays in a cave, somehow he, he had a sense, uh, maybe this is the man to help me go deeper. Uh, so he went to uh, Bodhidharma and he sat outside his cave and uh, for days and days and asked him to, for teaching and uh, Bodhidharma ignored him. Probably if we showed up at a master's uh, door and we asked him for teaching and if he ignored us for about three minutes, we'd probably get up and leave. No comment. But in those days, they had a little more, uh, a little more energy for, for Dharma. So he just, he just stayed out there. And uh, his name was Guang, thought to himself. In olden days, people sought the way by smashing their bones to take out the marrow, slashing their veins to feed hungry animals, spreading their hair to cover the muddy road in order to let a spiritual man pass through safely, or leaping off a cliff to feed a hungry tigress. All through the ages, people have behaved like this. Who am I not to do so? So what he's referring to are what are known in the Buddhist canon as the Jataka tales. Maybe some of you are familiar. These are uh, really a canon of stories, most of which are about animals. And they really uh, show these are the, just some of the prior lives of the Buddha. And they're really, sh they're really about showing that even though in this lifetime we see this full-blown enlightened being, that if you look into the history, you see lifetime and lifetime of lifetime of a willingness to do to be selfless, to help others, right? And so, you know, this, this is not masochism when he talks about people. It's like people would, would offer, you know, their body, their blood, if someone or an, another animal needed it, right? This is about supreme selflessness and a, and a willingness even to give one's own body to help another. The story of the hungry tigress is quite simply starving tigress, baby cubs all around her, uh, the Buddha in a prior lifetime, he's out hunting with a bunch of his friends, uh, sees this, sees that the cubs are going to die if she doesn't get anything to eat, goes up to a cliff above where she is and leaps off. So he falls dead right in front of her. She then eats, and she's able to suckle her cups, and they live. This is a famous story. So this is what, when he's referring to, if you, if you go, gee, I don't know people like that, you know. <laughs> he's, he's, talking about, he's talking about these, these stories of, of, of the, the lengths that people went to benefit others. And again, don't think that's so extreme in our own lifetime. Uh, firemen, EM, you know, people sacrifice themselves for others. Parents sacrifice themselves for children, right? So it's not unknown that people in certain circumstances are willing to put aside their own bodies and their own comforts to benefit others. We, in our own day, we, soldiers do it all the time, right? Suicide bombers do it all the time. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not an unknown, right? Please understand that. Um, so, he's been out there, he's been uh, waiting, asking, he's obviously getting a little uh, disheartened, but he reminds himself. So, on December 9th of that year, it snowed heavily in the night. He stood firmly without moving outside Bodhidharma's cave. 
By dawn the next day, the falling snow had piled so deep that it reached his knees. So he's out there now. It snowed all night. It's cold. He's wet. So Master Bodhidharma takes pity on him, turns, and says to him, What are you seeking, standing in the snow for such a long time? Shen Kuang started to cry, and in tears begged him, Please, Master, have mercy. Open the gate of nectar. Deliver the message that liberates sentient beings. Bodhidharma said, The supreme unequaled spiritual way of the Buddhas is accessible only after vast eons of striving to overcome the impossible and to bear the unbearable. How could a man like you, small virtue, little wisdom, slight interest, slow mind, attain the true vehicle. Striving for it would be in vain. Right? It only gets better or worse, depending on your uh, point of view. You see, what's he doing? Is he really putting him down? No. Is he what? Shaking. He's shaking him up and he's challenging him and trying to get him to, you know, go another step. And obviously, we know Bodhidharma hasn't talked to anybody in nine years, according to the story. I mean, so he obviously sees something in him. Right? And rather than giving the treasure too quickly, kind of raises the bar a little bit. Holds it out, right? Supreme unequaled spiritual way of the Buddhas. Right. I have it, but not for the likes of you. After listening to this exhortation from the Master, Shen Kuang secretly took out a sharp knife that he had hidden in his robe, and he cut off his left arm and placed it in front of the master. Realizing now that he was a good vessel for the Dharma, the master said, All Buddhas in search of the way have begun by ignoring their bodies for the sake of the Dharma. Now that you have cut off your arm in front of me, you have the right disposition. Okay? So whether this happened the way it happened, or whether this is a little allegorical, uh, but you get the meaning of it, right? You know, we think it's all about the teacher, but you see, it's really mostly about the student and the student's recept receptivity to the teachings, openness, enthusiasm, right? There is something about the receptacle that is perhaps even more important than that which is pouring out. And you can see that Bodhidharma is, you know, he's got a treasure. This treasure of Dharma. This treasure of the awakened mind. He's not going to just give it out to anybody. Because he knows it's, it would be a waste of time. It's like if you, uh, you know, if you had a beautiful diamond ring. You know, would you go to Walmart to buy, a, a, you know, some kind of plastic ring to set it in? No. Right? You'd want to find a beautiful setting for it, worthy of such a diamond. So, now that you've cut off your arm in front of me, you may have the right disposition. 
And then the master gave him a new name, which I'm not sure what it means. We co, which is what he's called. Hmm. And so now we co, now that he's got a new name, says to Bodhidharma, May I hear about the Dharma seal of the Buddha? May I hear this highest teaching of the Buddha? Well, I'm going to need a little more tea for this. <laughs> I don't want to say it with a dry throat. So he asks him, he asks Bodhidharma, may I hear about the Dharma seal of the Buddha? And Bodhidharma says, the Dharma seal is not something that can be heard about from others. Right? I mean, it's really, you see what he's turning, he's like, right? Here this guy has been, I mean, to the point of cutting off his arm, standing all night in the snow. Why? Because he wants something from Bodhidharma, right? And now Bodhidharma finally says, all right, but you can't get this from somebody else. I mean, can you, do you see what's going on here? It's really quite wonderful. He just, you know. But if you think it's just about the words, you're not understanding. It's about this interaction between a teacher and a student. It's the mind state, right? right. On the one hand, he just kind of ramps up his yearning, his enthusiasm, right? Can you see it? You know, like, he's totally focused now. You know, this is all. Nothing else is important, right? My own comfort, you know, all night in the snow, my own body, right? All the practicalities. It's like, you know, gee, without an arm, this is going to be a, this is going to be a, you know, be a little changing my future life, you know, of having one arm, you know, it's gonna, you see, when, you know, all the way we think, uh, you know, weighing pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Let me see, can I really do without this arm? And, well, I hear they make good prosthetics, maybe, you know what I'm saying? That's the way we would do it now. We would weigh cost benefit analysis, weigh it, to, you know, can I really get by with one arm? You know, can you, see? that's how we do it, right? But that's not how, you know, here, Master. So again, you can see he's kind of led him to the, you know, right to the edge, right? And he's like hanging on every word. And what does he say to him? You can't get the Dharma seal from someone. So once again, he pulls the rug out, like with Emperor Wu. He's brought him to a state of intense concentration. And then he introduces him to a state of complete confusion. Right? It's like your whole life, you've just been focused on getting this thing. Right? And now you're finally there, and somebody tells you, oh, this thing doesn't exist. Right? It's like, whew. The Dharma seal is not something that can be heard about from others. Wiko says, but my mind is not at peace. Please, Master. Can you set my mind at peace? Okay. And this now kind of again gives you a sense of what Zen is about. So the so Bodhidharma says. So, like many of us, Wiko uh, says, you know, it's it's all about this mind of mine. 
It's not at peace. neurotic. It's full of thoughts. It gives me no rest. Right? And rather than giving him a little sermon, right, about mind and thoughts and practice, he says to him, bring me your mind and I will set it at peace for you. This is Zen, right? Just turns it around. Rather than, you know, talking about it, he says, okay. He, he accepts it. Yeah. Your mind's not at peace. You want a peaceful mind. You want me to do it. Good. Bring it to me, and I will set it at peace. Right. So then, see, he turns it around. Now we co has to do what? He has to look here. See, he's been looking out here. All along he's been looking out here, getting the teaching, getting the instructions, getting the transmission. Right. It's told, can't get it. But he says, but well, but I'm still, my mind is still, you know, afflicted. Right? Please, Master, help me. And the Master says, okay, I'll help you. Please show me your afflicted mind. Bring it right here. So he turns it around. And so we go, and we don't know whether it was instantaneous, we don't know whether it was time, but he went through a very deep turning about in his own mind and looking for that thing called his afflicted mind. And then, he's, and then he finally goes and says to the Master, I have searched and searched, but I cannot find anything. And Bodhidharma says, your mind has now been set at peace. And supposedly at this moment, we had a great profound awakening. So it's a very famous, this was the first transmission from, from India to China. And can you see how it was done? It wasn't done with, it was done with words, but the words were always meant to promote a mind state. They weren't words to just give more words, right? They weren't just meant to satisfy intellectually. He didn't say, Intrinsically, there's no such thing as mind, did he? He didn't say your busy, active mind in its true essence is empty. Right? He had him experience it for himself with his words. And again, it it really tells you really the essence of this tradition, which is the peaceful mind does not, we do not achieve the peaceful mind by endlessly trying to tamp it down, by endlessly trying to calm it. That is only a short-term solution. We pacify the mind by understanding what it is, what thoughts are, what our minds really are, what its nature is. And when we understand that, then the drama ends. So, we've almost been going for an hour and a half, wow. So this is a little introduction. We are over these next days going to be uh, uh, hearing more direct teachings. 
uh, from the Zen tradition, uh, from the Chinese Zen tradition and the Japanese and Korean Zen traditions. Uh, but this is where we begin. Are there any questions about what we've heard this morning? <coughs> mm-hmm. This Zen tradition is so brilliantly related because it was it was captivating the way that you you share it as a teacher. But this you present this dichotomy between intention and action. Or it sounded like say that you uh, that, that, that just to say more. I'm not clear that economy between intention and action. Yeah, in other words, it's really the intention that is important, and the action is sort of secondary. What do you mean by action, Alex? I'm not clear what you're talking about. Well, I mean based on these like, when, three anecdotes. When you were relating this confrontation between between Bodhidharma and Emperor Wu, mm -hmm. you know, the emperor did not have right intention. He wanted the merit. He wanted the accolades. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe he would have built a beautiful temple and that would have served right. Buddhism. But he didn't He didn't really value that Bodhidharma. He wanted the intention to be pure and the action to him wasn't important. Well, I'm not, I don't know if I understand. I mean, he... So, the, <laughs> let me see if I can understand what you're saying. For the emperor, his actions and, and his intentions were congruent. His actions was to earn merit, and therefore, I mean, his intention was to earn to do meritorious actions, good deeds, and therefore he would he was a good Buddhist, and would earn good merit, which would only you know be good for his future. Okay? His intention was not to wake up. Right? His intention was more, well, what we just said about it. So we might say that his actions were congruent, but they were just kind of at a more ordinary, more religious, more traditionally religious way of approaching the spiritual life. Right? Uh, Bodhidharma, and again, that, that we, we know uh, that uh, as Buddhism developed in India and then spread, it became, in a certain way, a religion for, for many people that was practiced in this way. I mean, different than Christianity and Judeo-Christian tradition, but a lot of similarities. But we're also realizing that at the same time, within the broader Buddhist practice, tradition, whatever, there is this other tradition of direct experience, right? Which again, had obviously not come to China, or as far as we know, right? And in this case, uh, intention and the action is very different <laughs> than the Empress. <laughs> because as opposed to uh, external actions, what is most important in this tradition is the internal action. And this is why Zen is really, you know, the prime practice in Zen is meditation. Right? It, is, it is the meditation sect. Not again that in Zen they don't teach and, you know, scripture, but because it's about realization. It's not about earning merit. It's not against earning merit, <laughs> but it's about understanding there is something else going on here. Right? So, in that sense, what Bodhidharma did was very congruent with the way a Zen master would respond, right? A Zen master is trying to help the students wake up, right? If you just want to be a better Buddhist, go to the temple down the street, right? It's not like that's bad down there, you know what I'm saying? But this is about waking up. So we see, you know, like, like with Emperor Wu or like with uh, Wei Ko, you know, that Bodhidharma is responding to the person. Right? Emperor Wu obviously didn't have a clue. You know, Bodhidharma didn't call him an idiot. Right? He didn't say, oh, God. You know, he just, in his own mind, went, yeah, you know, not ready. Okay, 
I mean, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't angry. I'm just continuing the anecdote. I mean, we don't know, but, you know, he wasn't angry, he wasn't disappointed, he wasn't hurt, he didn't take it personally. I mean, what's wrong with me? Gee, maybe I'm not really the, you know, he go, oh, they're just not ready. Okay, I'll just, just go practice for nine years. Hmm? Quite, quite wonderful. Hmm? And then somebody shows up who seems to be ready. But even then, he kind of <laughs> ramps it up a little bit. You know, maybe because he's been waiting nine years. He's got a lot, <laughs> you know, he's got a lot stored up. <laughs> you know, maybe when this guy shows up, he just wanted to make sure, is this really the real thing? You know what I mean? So he, uh, he kind of, he, he, he kind of, you know, raises the ante a little bit. But he, he does. And then again, you know, rather than give him platitudes, rather than give him words, he got him to just look, right? into his own mind. There's the answer. I mean, that takes courage, right? And, and real, I think, compassion. Because he knows that the suffering of, of beings is coming from their own minds. And therefore, the resolution or the cessation of suffering can only come about within their own minds. Right? And so it's a very, uh, very profound uh, teaching that we've been given. So I'd say total congruence between intention and action. But again, the intention is to be awake, to be free, to be liberated from suffering, to want to know my own mind. You know, I mean, uh, we co, right? You know, the emperor was just talking about good deeds, good merit, you know, all the things I'm doing, right? We co, if you remember, his question was, you know, I suffer. Huh? Very simple, you know? I suffer. My mind suffers. I mean, that's all in this, my mind's not at peace. I suffer. My mind is not at peace. So, you know, no, can you see no BS? You know, no, blah, 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 no stories, no this, no that, you know. No issues, just, I suffer. Can you help me? Please liberate me from my suffering. That's, I mean, that's what he's asking. Yeah, and I ask yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because you've taught me over the years that Buddhism is a developmental model. Mm -hmm. You don't teach the same to right. all your students and mm -hmm. who they are in their development where you, where you approach them. Well, clearly the emperor was at a very different developmental right. model than we could. Wei Ko. Wei Ko. Or, and I'm, I don't know anything about Chinese, so I'm probably, right, right. I, I'm probably doing as bad a job as you are, so forgive me for correcting you. <laughs> <laughs> you might even be correct. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, the emperor was not going to be um, enlightened by this individual before him because he was at a different place in his mind. Right. He was the emperor, right. and he was. This was a perfunctory exchange. It's like you know, what can you do for mm -hmm. him? But if we go to the heart of Buddhism, mm -hmm. which is to alleviate suffering. Mm -hmm. This emperor was probably, through his actions as emperor, being able to build temples yeah, and yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of good things yeah, for, yeah. for the ordinary folk. So for Bodhidharma to piss him off maybe wasn't the best strategic move in terms of alleviating suffering. Let me get this straight. You are critiquing Bodhidharma's interaction with Emperor Wu. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say this is being recorded. I mean, I just, uh, <laughs> what if? <laughs> I would say you don't want to go down that road. Uh, we have to, uh, you know. He was uh, again. You know, it's like we have to understand. I think. I think you're you're off here. Okay. I mean, yeah. So the question, <laughs> Alex is kind of challenging Bodhidharma and going, "Hey, I mean, Emperor Wu was doing good. I mean, I mean, let's say he took it the wrong way, and all of a sudden he stopped." building temples and supporting, I mean, yeah, so we don't know that, okay? I guess, you know, he took a risk, didn't he? But, uh, but, but, you know, just like in the same way, and I said earlier, you know, when the Buddha did the thing with the flower in Makashapa, he didn't say to everybody else, you know, forget it, right? He, you know, 
he acknowledged Mahakashapa, but he continued to teach in the same way. And he didn't tell everybody else, you know, just hold up flowers and don't attend to all the vast volume of teaching. In the same way, uh, you know, based on this interchange, I mean, I think you are uh, extrapolating things that aren't there, Alex. I mean, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, cut it out, emperor. Don't do it anymore, emperor. You know, he, he, he went, oh, okay. You know, he kind of let him be. And, uh, and actually, I think, apocryphally, I think they do say later on when Bodhidharma did have disciples, the emperor did, something did happen with him in practice. But uh, at that point, it didn't. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So you want to be careful. That is why, like you said, you know, in Buddhism, you know, different teachings for different people. And, and, I mean, I think you're totally wrong here, but in a bigger thing, like I said, you know, if there was somebody out there who was, you know, doing good deeds and very charitable and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and you kind of went with them and you realize, yeah, there is a lot of ego, but you realize that's where they're at. You know, you wouldn't go, you know, well, God, you're just an egocentric person who's only doing it for your own self-edification and what other people think of you and you're disgusting and... Yeah, that's probably not the best way to proceed <laughs> with that person, right? I mean, so, yeah, so I agree with you. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, we're not, you know, you know, we're not here to make a case f for the truth. In Buddhism, there's no such thing as the truth. Everything is relative to the person. So one person's truth is another person's truth. So, um, you know, sort of maybe uh, talk to that person who's totally... Uh, you know, uh, giving so totally for self selfish reasons, you know, to begin to talk to them a little bit about, you know, having also a kind of little higher aspiration, you know, of just doing good for the sake of doing good, you know, maybe a conversation to have with them if they're open to it, rather than going, you know, calling them names and, you know what I mean? So you just kind of want to move people along with developmental. Again, you're talking... Uh, you know, as I say, in this thing, you're talking about a a high level of interchange, right, between, a, you know, this great uh, master, uh, again, for nine years, has been, uh, has, hasn't found a disciple, this one uh, 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 student who has been obviously studying and practicing uh, various kinds of dharmas, uh, you know, for many years, and it's a good synchronicity when they come together. And Bodhidharma, you know, we have to believe, saw the potential in him. And so he gave him, you know, he gave him his best shot, so to speak. And it worked. So, uh, yeah. So, good. Um, yeah. So, what does this have to do with... Uh, your practice and what we're doing here. Coming down. Uh, we are here primarily on a meditation retreat. We're doing a lot of meditation in the meditation hall, outside the meditation hall. We are learning to practice. Uh, our practice is about the mind. Okay? You know, when you are practicing mindfulness, you are learning about how to have a mind that is aware and awake and present. It's about the mind. Some people think it's about the object of the mind. So we, let's say we went outside and we're going, well, I'm practicing mindful walking or mindfulness in nature. So we just kind of look around. You know, like that. Monkey mind, jumping around. Thinking that it's like, how many objects can I consume in my looking? No. It's about the, a mind that it's aware. Right? To see the, what is it, to see the world in the grain of sand, you know, that famous line like that. We don't have to see everything. Everything's in one thing. 
So, when we are practicing mindfulness, it's not like a laser-like, it's like cultivating a mind that is awake, that is present, right? And so we don't need to be present to everything, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying. You know, we can be outside and doing walking meditation and just enjoying where we are, you know, and seeing what we see, right? We don't have to see everything, okay? This is not a, a nature walk. Is that clear? I mean, I'm not saying anything wrong with a nature walk, but this is not a nature walk. This is cultivating mindfulness. So we want to, we're cultivating a mind. Cultivating a mind when we're sitting, we're cultivating a mind when we're standing, we're cultivating a mind when we're walking, we're cultivating a mind that's present to whatever is for us, to our senses, and if we're focused on our mind, we are mindful of our mind. Traditionally, uh, in the uh, meditative tradition, we cultivate mindfulness, we cultivate concentration, and we cultivate insight. Insight is this deep looking into. What are we looking into? The mind itself. But before we can look into the mind itself, there has to be some kind of stability and clarity, right? The proverbial, you know, the sediment in the, in the pond has to settle down uh, for us to be able to see what's on the bottom, okay? As long as there's all kinds of sediment and muck, right? We, we, we have no idea what's, what's really in the pond. So if you ask me what the purpose of Zen, it's in to see our, in our true nature. But to see our true nature, we have to be able to look into the mind and see what's there. So there has to be a, a calming and a stabilizing. Is that clear? It doesn't mean an absence of thoughts and complete, but there's got to be some room. <laughs> okay? There's got to be some space. You know, if it's, if it's opaque, can't see. Right? So there's got to be some clarity. Is that clear? So that's what we're doing in, in right now. You know. When we hear a Dharma talk, we're just mindful. We're just present. We just take it in. Let it go deep. We're looking for meaning, not for the words. When we walk, we just walk in mindfulness, maintaining our concentration. If the mind begins to uh, wander into dispersion, we bring it back. Very simple. We don't. Rec- there's no recrimination. There's no. There's no drama. Right? Don't bring your your usual drama into the Dharma. <laughs> And start making it about you and, and how you want to be, and you're disappointed in yourself, or you should be more, you know, blah, 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 as they say. Right? You've got to be very careful. You don't just make your spiritual life just a kind of a, a mirror of your worldly life. Okay? Just practice. No drama, no recrimination. Right? If you fall down, just get up. No need to blame yourself. No need to call yourself any names. I mean, eventually you're going to get up anyhow. Right? So just get up. Walk again. I mean, if there was something there you tripped on, you, you, know, there's no, you know, if you got caught up on something, to kind of take a moment just to see what you got caught up on and be aware of it. Yeah, I'm kind of obsessing about that. Get a, let's let it go. Past. I'm obsessing about that. Yeah, let it go. Just future. So it's not as if there's not a little looking, right? So you don't keep tripping on the same on the same thing, right? So there is a little bit of that, but it doesn't have to be obsessive. You know, you don't have to go into your childhood or you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because mo- most of, most of us by now we know our we we know our issues, don't we? More or less. I mean, yeah, I mean, how much self knowledge of, of of that do you need? Right. 
we want to transform. So this is a special Bodhidharma I brought. So I see I'm not in I'm not in the hall the whole time. So <laughs> he's 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 reporting to me how everybody's doing. I mean, okay. <laughs> but even the uh, scroll you can see. I mean that's very much how Bodhidharma is usually represented. You know, he's kind of fierce guy. But it's you know he's not fierce just to be cruel. He's fierce because he's compassionate. He knows sometimes we need somebody looking right at us. Right, come on, Alex. Knock it off. Right? You know, sometimes we need somebody like that, right? Just to kind of... Kind of... When we wander off. When we indulge ourselves a little bit. Sometimes we need just 